Good morning. Thanks for listening to us. This is Lisa Condit, and today I'm here with Jim Moran, the Director of Outreach for the American Antiquarian Society. We have a great partnership going, and we have a great event coming up. Good morning and welcome, Jim. Thank you for having me. It's a delight to be here. Absolutely. So we were talking a little bit before the program started about what is the American Antiquarian Society? One of those questions that everybody asks. We are uh, that big domed building on the corner of uh, Park Avenue and Salisbury Street. Uh, That big brick building that everybody wonders, what what is that? (laughs) We are a, a research library of American history and culture. We collect the printed record of this country before the year 1876. And inside that building are about 4 million items. From wow. the great works of literature uh, to the equivalent of 19th and 18th century junk mail. That's amazing. So, But it's all dated before 1876, you said? Before 1876. From the f- uh, we collect from the first imprint, which is 1640, uh, to 1876 when... Uh, the copyright laws change, and by law, two copies go to uh, the Library of Congress. 1876 is also the year of the centennial, and it's also the last full year of Reconstruction. So we had to stop somewhere, and we decided that would be uh, a good date to stop. At. Well, absolutely, because I bet your walls would no longer contain all of the written word if we kept going yeah, and that's going. That's true. We, we have a lot of stuff. <laughs> we could, uh, it would be a lot more if we kept going from 1876. But we, as I said, we have 4 million items wow. of all kinds, and they were printed throughout the United States and a portion of Canada and the British West Indies. Wow. All 50 states are represented in the collection. Wow. And we keep it all. We, we've we been digitizing a lot of it with uh, partners like Redex and EBSCO and other vendors, but we don't get rid of anything. So it's <laughs> <laughs> like bi- grandma's attic. Uh, and so it's all, uh, we're, we are the nation's attic in a way. I guess that's the Smithsonian, but we're uh, the nation's library in a way of early American material. And in addition to that, we are a, a learned society. We have 980 elected members, and we do all kinds of things. We do uh, fellowships for people to come and, and work in the library. We do uh, programs for teachers, K-12 teachers. We do seminars and workshops for academic scholars of all kinds. Um, and we do public programs. We do uh, lectures and performances and programs with uh, uh, other organizations in the city like the Hanover Theater. Absolutely. Before we get to that, <clears throat> How many societies like yours are there in this country? Well, there's nothing quite like us. Uh, There are about a handful of independent research libraries like us, Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but none with the, the collecting policy we have or the collections that we have. The collections, uh, particularly before the year 1820, from you know 1640 to 1820, we have the largest single collection of that kind of material anywhere in the world. That is so interesting, and what an amazing resource. I have always wanted to go into that building. When are you open? Well, we're open um, Monday through Friday, but we give public tours every Wednesday at 3 o'clock. We so. have wanted to do that. Yeah. Please Absolutely. Come. We come. will. It's we a, will. It's a great thing. We've also always been, even though we're a national organization, we've always been in Worcester. We were founded here in 1812 by Isaiah Thomas, and we were founded in part to keep us safe from British gunboats because in 1812 we were at war with the British, and there was a great concern that uh, you know that anything in striking distance of the Navy would be in peril, and in fact the Library of Congress was in peril a couple of years later, so it was a good move. What an amazing resource for the people who live here, and we don't even really realize it. Out of curiosity, how is the information organized? Is it organized in the traditional methods of today's libraries? or? Well, we have a special cataloging system based upon our own, um, our own collections, um, but a lot of the material is now um, online. We have an online catalog mm-hmm. and actually an online registration and calling system, so people can do a lot of work about what they want to do in our library from home and come in all prepared to do it uh, from from the work they've done 
in their pajamas at home. Oh, that's great. I bet I bet that's a recommended approach, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes. <laughs> Cuz honestly, it seems overwhelming. To yeah, think we're... of oh, every printed word from the 1600s to the early 1800s. Oh, I where often to start? say that we're the best place to go last, you know, to get, <laughs> uh, do a lot of research in your local library or online, get a sense of really what you want to do and then come to see us. Now, how long have you been with the American Antiquarian Society? I've been Society? with the Antiquarian Society 18 years. So, and I do our public programming, mm -hmm. I do our K-12 programming, and I do um, an interesting uh, fellowship program for creative and performing artists and writers. Ooh, tell us more about that. We award about five fellowships a year to people in virtually any discipline. We've had playwrights, we've had novelists, we've had poets, we've had filmmakers and radio producers, performance artists. Um, uh, uh, painters, sculptors, any kind of art, and, and nonfiction journalists come in. We pay them to work in the library for a month to do research on a project that is concerns our, our, you know, our collection. So what kind of projects are you working on? And we have all kinds of things. I'm sure. Um, <laughs> and uh, in, we started this program in 1995, and one of our first fellows was a gentleman by the name of Jeffrey Hatcher. And ah. he is going to be the subject of the program that we are doing with the Hanover Theater. Jeff Hatcher was and is a playwright and a screenwriter and has gained quite a national reputation. And he came to the society to research a play that he called Sockdology. That's such a funny word. Yes, and it's, an, uh, it's just one of those that makes you go, what? Right. <laughs> uh, well, uh, in the 19th century, sockdology was a boxing term, and it meant a, a, a knockout punch or the brutal end of everything. Ooh. And it was in the dialogue of the play Our American Cousin, which was a very popular comedy in the 19th century. And uh, this play was playing at Ford's Theater in April of 1865, and it was playing on the night that Lincoln came to the theater, and the word sockdology reputedly may have been the last word that Lincoln actually heard, because it was in that line of, doc, uh, of dialogue that John Wilkes Booth snuck into Lincoln's boot, um, uh, box and shot him in the back of the head. How very symbolic. It is not lost on me, or I'm sure anybody listening. Yes, yes, it's quite uh, symbolic uh, and an interesting turn of events. And Jeff used this kind of historical footnote to create a play about the acting troupe that was performing uh, um, Our American Cousin during this momentous event. And what did Lincoln's assassination mean to them? And what does it mean to the country then? And what does it mean to us now? Oh, that's so interesting. So I know you've been working really closely with Nell Lazor. She's our director yes. of development on this particular program. And just to give you all listening a little bit of background, this is part of our Access Hanover Lyceum series, which is a free member benefit so that our members can come to these different talks, lectures, find out what's going on, again, behind the scenes, but in a whole different way. And it's so great that we have the opportunity to work with partners like you to do a more academic review of any given topic. It's a, it's a great program that you run, and Nell uh, approached us, uh, to, and we started to think about what we could do. I thought about Jeff Hatcher, and um, I've been talking to Jeff for many years about the possibility of uh, bringing uh, the play to us in some fashion, and uh, we just, you know, it all just clicked. It was an idea that just seemed to make a lot of sense. Um, the evening will be, as you said, a kind of behind-the-scenes uh, look at um, uh, how one creates theater, and specifically how one creates historically-based theater. So Jeff, the playwright, will be with us. Uh, we've compiled a cast of great uh, local and regional actors, professional actors, who will be reading uh, the play. Actually, what we'll do is um, Jeff's going to, to pick selected scenes from the play, and he will introduce those, kind of set them up under, uh, so the audience understands what's happening and what's going to happen after that. Uh, the actors will then come and read, step forward and read these scenes very dramatically. And then at, at the end of the evening, Jeff is going to lead us in a discussion about how did he come to write this play. 
And um, I think I will also join in and talk about the fellowship program we have and uh, how one, you know, kind of creates historical theater. Um, on my uh, day, on my night job, I guess, um, I uh, am a playwright and a producer who also has written historically based plays. And a couple of the actors are people I've worked with in productions of my own and others. So I think um, it will be a kind of a lively discussion about, you know, what are, what, what's, what's historically accurate, what's made up, and what's the marriage of the, of the two that makes historical theater so vibrant and interesting. Oh, I'm really looking forward to that, especially on the heels of Les Miserables, you know yeah, what I'm yeah. saying? And it's the movie just, Lincoln. Uh, right. You know, these are uh, great, uh, I think, great uh, interpretations of historical events. Uh, they are both creative and historically accurate, and it's 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 an interesting marriage of those two. I uh, love it. I was a comparative literature major, so, so you, yes, history you know, combined yeah. with literature yeah, just sure. really Makes, fits nicely. Yeah. I, I can't wait, and it sounds like such a great opportunity for people to come and really get a whole new perspective on plays as well as just the historical writing aspect right, of it. Right. So any spoilers about what kind of impact Lincoln's assassination did have on any of the actors? Uh, tr uh, profound. Let me I'm put sure. It that way. Um, Laura Keene was um, a leading actress in um, in the theater at that time and was performing in Our American Cousin. She had an acting troupe and, and essentially the troupe was, was devastated and had mm. a very hard time performing I'm sure. uh, for quite a while afterwards. And it really was a, 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 a tremendous shock to the whole country. Absolutely. And the fact that it happened on Good Friday... Uh, mm. during Holy Week mm -hmm. in a country that particularly at that time was very, very uh, religious and very Christian, uh, had a, a huge impact um, on our collective psyche, as it does today. I Absolutely. Mean, it's, it's still something that we, we think about. We're going to take a short break, so stay tuned for more Behind the Scenes at the Hanover Theater here on AM 830 WCRN. Welcome back to Behind the Scenes at the Hanover Theater. This is Lisa Condit. We continue our conversation with Jim Moran. So what is Jeff Hatcher doing now? Um, I can tell you that he is uh, doing a lot of screenwriting, mm. uh, and he's doing a lot of um, adaptions of, of different um, work. I know he was in England uh, working on a recent um, work, but I... Uh, don't recall what the actual title of it is, um, but he uh, has written a lot of plays, including um, uh, his play, Scotland Road, which was about uh, the sinking of the Titanic. Uh, uh, it, other plays of his were Three Viewings, uh, A Picasso. He wrote the uh, adaptions for The Turn of the Screw, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Sherlock Holmes and the Adventures of the Suicide Club, and his um, uh, he's also written for the Columbo television series, and he's written um, uh, a play called Complete Female Stage Beauty, which he turned into the film um, Stage Beauty. So, so I'd say um, it's fair to say he's a, a prolific writer. A very prolific writer, and has been widely produced in regional theaters around the country, as well as on Broadway, and is now branching out into film and television. So, so what an honor and an opportunity for us to have him Absolutely, at the Hanover yeah. Theater through this partnership. So one thing that it's a little off topic, but I have to ask you, what's your favorite part of the collection or is there a particular piece mm -hmm. or a particular document or, you know, combination um, area? Give us, I give us a little insight. I there. can't... I, I can't tell you a favorite because I think I have so many. But I have I will, the same problem. <laughs> I will share with you just because it's fresh in my mind. I, I, I just gave a tour to uh, Clark University students mm. who were studying public history, and we I shared with them three items from the collection that I that are among my favorite. Um, in addition to printed material, we do have some manuscripts, and we have three letters, all written to a gentleman by the name of. Charles Slack in the autumn of 1859. The first, and I'm going to paraphrase all of these, the first is uh, from a gentleman saying, I cannot make my, my speaking engagement. I, I should explain to you, Charles Slack was running a lecture series in Boston at this time. 
And the first letter is to uh, explaining that he cannot make his engagement. He has 19 federal marshals after him. Oh. Oh. And this gentleman is writing this from Canada, and his name is Frederick Douglass. Oh. And the next letter is, states, um, uh, it's actually from Ralph Waldo Emerson. Wow. And he uh, says to Mr. Slack, I understand you have an opening next Tuesday or whenever it is. I, um, I highly recommend that you book uh, a young gentleman by the name of Henry David Thoreau. I heard him give a, a talk in Concord, and the whole nation should hear it. And the last letter is from Thoreau, saying that indeed he will come, and his subject will be Captain John Brown. Wow. The reason Frederick Douglass is in Canada is because he's implicated in John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry. And uh, Thoreau's passionate defense of John Brown turns John Brown in the eyes of many people in 1859 from kind of a wacko into a martyr for the abolitionist cause and really completely transforms how we view John Brown. So these are just That's really amazing. cool letters. <laughs> totally, because you know what? You're connecting the history to the feeling to the people yeah. and their actual writings yeah. and the circumstances and the timing. Wow. And, and you're seeing history being made. You know, mm. in 1859, Thoreau is not a well-known person. He's hardly a household name. Mm -hmm. This speech will, will make him more famous, but he still won't really gain the stature he gains after his death. Emerson is, of course, uh, powerful, and you're really seeing this, you know, history unfolding. History is absolutely, is dynamic, absolutely. And, uh, and what's so, another part that's interesting is at that point, history was really verbally transferred, sure, or by the written word. Well, and and those right. two are the same. Um, I was reading an article just the other day about uh, the sociability of reading. Mm -hmm. You know, people sat in a parlor and read aloud and and read together and to discuss things together. Um, and this bo this uh, paper was actually talking about how Civil War soldiers were conducting, trying to read the same things their family was at home at the same time. They were kind of breaking up the Bible and saying, let's read this chapter on this day and this chapter on that day and so that they would have a connection mm. in that sense so reading was much more social than we, we tend to think of it I think we think of it as you know go in a room alone and read I don't think about it as being something I'll do with my family I, I won't read it aloud I won't talk about it with people but that's how 19th century this was their, their major form of entertainment and information well I think that people did a lot more reading aloud in, in groups even 20, 30 years ago yeah, than they I think do that now. Could be true. That's Although true. books on CD and books on tape have true. revived that tradition a little bit. Yes, they have, yeah. Even I, with my friends, will all try and read something together. Yeah. Yeah. Now, do you happen to have any discussion groups? Actually, we're, we're going to start a reading and discussion group. Mm -hmm. uh, probably will happen in the fall, but uh, look for that. Ple people can check us out on the web, and they can uh, get a sense of what our programming is. And when they come to a program, sign up, and we'll send information. Oh, that's great. I think I want to join your reading and discussion group. So what's your website? Our website is uh, www.americanantiquarian.org. Go there, people. Inspire yourselves. Find out more about history. Connect. Yes, I love yes. it. I and love come it. On <laughs> April twenty fourth to the Hanover Theater. That's um, right. We're going to uh, talk a little bit more about that. So we've already talked a lot about it, but again, that's Wednesday, April twenty fourth, from five thirty to seven thirty at the theater. Now, do you know where the reading is going it, to take it place? It will take place actually on the stage of the theater. We're going to kind of turn the, the stage itself into a kind of a a theater performing space. Great. So people will be very intimate. They'll be very close to the playwright and to the actors, um, some of whom I think will be quite familiar to people, but they'll really be able to kind of get close to them. And, and that is so them. fun. People love, love, love being on the stage sure. at the Hanover Theater. And I can tell all of you that when you're standing on that stage and you look out at the audience, you can see the detailing behind the last row in the upper balcony and all of a sudden you have a whole new perspective oh, yeah, on yeah. what it really is like to perform on stage and also a new appreciation for the seats that are yeah, in the upper yeah, balcony yeah. truly far away and it really it's, is it's a, a whole nice different perspective from being in the audience absolutely yeah, it's really yeah, fun so i am thrilled that we're doing this partnership together oh, i hope so that we. we get to do more things like this i think that you've given people a good understanding as far as what they can expect when they come to our event 
part of this Access Hanover Lyceum series. You talked a little bit about, or a lot about, the society itself and the mm -hmm. building, which is absolutely gorgeous. What year was that building built? The building was built in 1909, mm. and it's our third home. We've oh. always been in Worcester, but we had two other buildings down on Lincoln Square before this one was built. In 1909, we got a lot of criticism for moving so far out of the city. Isn't that, that ironic? It was the sticks in 1909. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> Things have changed Things, a lot yeah, in the last exactly. century, right? <laughs> exactly. So is there so. anything else that you would like to share with people? I know. I just encourage people to come to, to this event, come see us on, on our Wednesday tour. We also have a, a, a this w is in addition to being part of the Hanover Access Series, is part of our series of public uh, programs. We have uh, a, a whole series of lectures uh, starting on April 19th when uh, Harold Holzer, who is a Lincoln expert Ooh. and uh, was a consultant to the Lincoln film, and he's going to come and talk about the Emancipation Proclamation because we're, we're coming at the 150th, uh, we're in that 150th anniversary of that famous document. And these issues are still relevant today. Absolutely. They really are. So people, even though it seems like it's history, it's interesting and it's vital and it's current and it can give you a whole new perspective on what people are thinking even today because history does repeat itself. Yeah, it does. And a lot of the issues that they faced 150, 200 years ago are still with us. They're Absolutely. Still so what other things do you have coming up in your speaker series? Uh, we've got um, a, 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 on May 2nd, we'll actually be launching uh, Nat Nathaniel Philbrick's latest book. His book is called Bunker Hill, A City, A Siege, A Revolution. Uh, obviously, it's about the early uh, years and the first year of the American Revolution, and he takes a really fascinating grounds, uh, on-the-ground approach to what was going on in Boston and in Massachusetts, including in Worcester, uh, in, in this uh, uh, book, which I think is destined to be a bestseller. Um, we'll, it will actually be published on uh, April 29th, but he'll be here May 2nd. Uh, and then we've got somebody looking at um, uh, 19th century theater and uh, its connection to reform movements on May 9th. And we've got um, uh, uh, one of, another one of our artist fellows who's written a fascinating book called The Movement of Stars based on the life of Maria Mitchell who is the first astronomer, uh, and she'll come in again, talk about how she created, how she researched this book and, and created it at, uh, under her fellowship. And then we've got a wonderful program on scrapbooks. Uh-oh. Kept lots of scrapbooks <laughs> in the 19th century, including Abraham Lincoln. He was a, a scrapbook keeper. And Ellen uh, Gr Gruber Garvey will come and talk about that, uh, again, based on a, a book that she wrote on May 23rd. And we wrap it up with uh, a, a story about um, two uh, famous wives of the Revolution, um, Benedict Arnold's wife and um, uh, the, the wife of... Um, uh, General Henry Knox. Well, I am going to pick up one of those brochures and I am going to see you at some of those events. I Please cannot do. wait. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank and we you for look forward, you're welcome. We look forward to seeing you. Everybody join us again on the 24th and stay tuned for more behind the scenes at the Hanover Theater. Thank you, Jim. Thank you.